Right, okay. Um, I'm going to kick off by, start, by talking about arms corporations and the connection between them and UK universities. Those of you who have been members of SGR for a while will know this is a subject that we have had a lot of concerns about and have um, written about over the years and um, campaigned about in, in various forms. So um, this is where we're going to start. So the first thing to say is that um, I'm going to draw on the reports that we've published over the last 10 years. There are copies of all these reports over there if you want to get more details. But the um, ones I'm going to draw on mostly from this list are Soldiers in the Laboratory, which we published 10 years ago, but it sort of set out the landscape of the issue and it still remains very relevant today. Um, we also looked at the universities involved in um, UK military projects. Um, uh, the first time we did it was in that report. We then returned to it behind closed doors in 2008, did a more specific analysis, and again I'll draw on some of those results as well. We looked at the corporate sector in particular in the 2009 report, and then in the most recent report, Offensive Insecurity, we did detailed analysis looking at government spending. We managed to get, for the first time, um, detailed information about what the Ministry of Defence spends its research budget on and where it goes. Um, so I'll, I'll refer to those as we go through. Um, so I'll, I'll start by talking about the broad landscape of UK military science and technology because this is where, within which, um, you, um, the university sector sits, and um, and it gives um, some context, which is rather important. So the first thing to note is that the UK military equipment spending um, drives so much of what goes on, and um, the current budget 178 billion pounds over the next 10 years. They, they have a budget over such a long time period. Um, which gives you an idea of, of how much of this is sort of set um, and decided. The last defence review was the end of last year and they bumped it up even further. The main programmes, you've got submarines, so that's both um, nuclear armed submarines and conventionally armed submarines. So you've got the conventionally armed astute submarines, um, seven are currently being built at the moment. Um, they um, built three or maybe four. Um, but the rest are, are still being developed. It's uh, one of many programs to go out over budget. And um, we're in the early stages of the new generation of new nuclear armed submarines. Um, now they've been given a name, the Dreadnought submarines. Um, that's where the other um, program is going. So within, and, and then there's the Warheads program and um, the UK component of the Missiles program, which is a mainly US program. So that together is the largest single area of, of the military weapons budget. Then you've got warships, the Queen Elizabeth aircraft carriers, and the new global combat ships. Combat planes, um, the new F-35s, uh, fighter bombers are um, the biggest component of that. And so on, down the list. So within that, you've got the research and development budget which currently stands at 1.7 billion pounds per year. It's about one sixth of UK government spending. Uh, after about 20 years of, of almost continuous falls since the end of the Cold War, in the last couple of years, it started rising again. So whilst everybody else has had austerity, the military has had an extra um, few hundred million to add to its research and development spending. Um, and we're one of the world's largest military spenders on, on military R&D. Um, the US is well out in the lead, but also, um, but the UK is, is one of the main, um, one of the largest ones behind the USA. If we, there are a number of research laboratories. The biggest one is the Defence Science and Technology Laboratory, which covers a whole range of areas. Um, the other one to point out, which is particularly relevant, and as you'll see within the university sector, is the Atomic Weapons Establishment, which both manufactures the warheads and is doing research and development on the new ones. Um, 
part of that research program is actually to make nuclear weapons more accurate, which is kind of a bizarre concept. Um, within these budgets, this is um, a study that we did in, in um, 2013. We managed to get detailed figures on what the R&D programs are, and they very much mirror the equipment programs themselves. So the largest area is nuclear weapons. Um, for all the talk about the importance of conventional military, it's actually the nuclear weapons one is where it commands the most of the science and technology work. So within that, you've got the warheads, you've got the new submarines themselves, and then you've got new nuclear actors for those submarines. Um, strike planes second, attack helicopters third, and then drones rapidly rising. We haven't been able to get more um, detail out of the MOD yet on more recent figures. Um, maybe they saw our report and decided they didn't <laughs> like having so much detail published. But, um, but from what we can gather, nuclear weapons are still at the top, strike planes are still very high, attack helicopters, that program is pretty much finished, but um, drones are rapidly increasing in, in their budget. Um, and, and within the analysis that we did, uh, as part of that report, we looked at which technologies that R&D has been spent on are about just territorial defence around the UK, UK waters, and which um, programmes give Britain the capability to project force far from home, far from the UK, and, um, and so under um, military definitions could be called offensive, and we found it was three quarters the R&D program was about offensive military program. <coughs> um, here's some figures for comparing the UK with um, other countries. You see the USA is far out in front, <laughs> dwarfs anything anybody else does. Um, but among the sort of following pack, um, at least of the countries <coughs> which there is data publicly available, the UK is, is ahead in terms of proportion of total public spending um, that goes on, to total R&D spending that goes on military programs. So you can see even ahead of South Korea, the borders on North Korea, even a long way ahead of France, um, the other main um, European military power, um, and well ahead of, of um, other industrial powers like Japan and Germany. So we've still got this focus on military research and development. Within that, the corporations play a particularly significant role. Most of the military research and development spending um, comes from government and, and is spent within industry. So most of the work is done within industry. Um, and within that, the UK is obviously home to um, a, a number of um, major arms companies. There are some that are UK HQ like um, EA Systems and Rolls-Royce. Um, and then you've got subsidiaries of all the other companies like um, US um, Lockheed Martin and Boeing, or from France you've got Talis has got a subsidiary here. Um, so we cover uh, the full range here of corporate um, military arms corporations. And the ethical issues are particularly significant, so it's not just the ones related to um, what Britain's foreign policy is, it's also related to how these arms are sold abroad and exports to oppressive regimes like Saudi Arabia um, and issues around um, the revolving door, lobbying, corruption. Rolls Royce at the moment is being investigated for corruption. That was on Panorama the other night, if you saw it. Um, so, even more ethical issues associated with. Um, Universities working with arms corporations than just um, the um, just um, national government funding for military R and D. And another thing to, to just give a quick mention to the nuclear dimension because of the resurgence of interest in civilian nuclear technologies, in key point and, um, and new generations of nuclear reactors that are of interest. Um, particularly to the government. There, there was a new study published a few months ago by Sussex University which pointed out just how enmeshed 
the um, civilian and military nuclear um, work is in, in this country. 46 companies that were working in both civilian and military nuclear work. And that includes um, military corporations like Rolls-Royce and, um, and um, Thales, but it also includes many of the big general nuclear corporations, uh, big engineering corporations. So you've got things like um, Mac Mott McDonald and Costan and Atkins, Carillion. All of these companies are also involved in both areas of uh, military work. And a particular overlap is around um, small nuclear reactors. So you've got small nuclear reactors in use um, in submarines, in the military sector, next generation under development to support um, Britain's nuclear weapons system. Um, and at the same time, you've got some of the same companies involved looking at small modular reactors for the civilian sector. <coughs> And how does this affect academic nuclear research? Well, I think that's, that's something that um, um, there isn't any work done on the moment, at the moment on that issue. So um, we need to do some, really. So the university sector itself. Um, as I, I've said, the main funding comes from the Ministry of Defence and the main um, organisations that are carrying out the research that the research and development is within the arms industry, but the UK universities do play a crucial <coughs> role. The streams of funding are much smaller, but nevertheless they are there. Um, the, the, as I say, the MOD spending is about 1.7 billion a year at the moment. Uh, it's something like 1.6 billion goes to the arms industry, 1.5, 1.6, depending on how you count the figures, and, and around 200 million of, of what the arms industry Bends on R and D goes to UK universities by our estimates. The government argues it's lower. We we're not convinced, and, and we talk about this more in the report. Um, there are a range of pathways. Um, the biggest <coughs> schemes, as I say, tend to be the corporate ones. There are some some companies like BA Systems tend to focus on a small number of universities and, and focus their work there. Others like Rolls Royce and Kinetic tend to spread their schemes across um, a wide range of universities, funding technology centres um, and uh, quite a few universities. There are also joint schemes, often involving the research councils, particularly the Engineering and Physical Sciences Research Council. And then there are some that are just government, although as far as we can tell, they seem to be shrinking and um, the main schemes tend to be the, the corporate ones and the joint, joint government industry ones. Which universities are involved? Well, we've done some research in this area. Other groups like Campaign Against Arms Trade and Nuclear um, Information Service have also done research in this area. There's some numbers about how many um, universities were investigated in each study. Um, <coughs> excuse me. Um, all the studies found virtually every university they looked at took some military funding in some shape or form. Um, there were one or two universities where either it wasn't clear or seemed to be zero. Um, but that was it. So, well, conclusion on the basis of this is, is that virtually every university in the UK takes some, some military funding. Um, within those studies, over half the universities in the UK have looked at. <coughs> um, and there are certain universities that are particularly have particularly large amounts of funding from military sources. And you'll notice from that list there, um, of the five biggest ones, that they include the top universities, Cambridge, Oxford, Imperial. Um, so the, the money tends to focus on, on areas with the greatest research expertise. Got a few examples. Um, the military funded projects, first of all, tend to focus on science and engineering departments, not really surprising. Um, but within that, they have particular areas where they they're, they're, um, have particular emphasis. Um, some examples of the program, the Atomic Weapons Establishment, has a big set of programs, as you should saw, 53 universities involved taking money from the Atomic Weapons Establishment. 
They argue none of this research is security classified, so it's all about science research that can be published in the open literature, but the crucial point is that it is all research that is relevant to nuclear weapons development so that they can make the use of, of that research in, in um, further development and maintenance of nuclear weapons in the UK. Um, they have a series of um, fellowships named after William Penny. For those of you who know your British nuclear history, William Penny was the father of the British H-bomb. Um, so they've marked um, that <laughs> in that way within the research area. Um, one of the places, one of the biggest places they fund is the Institute of Shock Physics at Imperial College. They give about 10 million pounds to that scheme so far. Um, and that is a whole area of physics um, around impacts and, and um, some of the, the fundamental aspects of physics that are relevant to a quite a wide range of areas within science, but of particular interest to um, nuclear weapons developers. Um, on the UAV side, this is drones research on manned aerial vehicles or remotely piloted aerial systems, depending on which name um, the military prefers at which time. Um, there are a whole bunch of schemes across the country. I, I point to um, the Centre for Autonomous Systems Technology at Liverpool University because there's been some research on this area. David Hooks, as some of you will know, has got a poster who will give you more details about what goes on there. <coughs> um, there are a number of projects there that have involvement from companies like EA Systems um, and developing various components of, of drones um, that, again, the applications can be very much relevant to the military industrial sector. So there's a wide range of concerns of this. One is the, the defense that is often used in this area is that it's only a small percentage of university income. Um, but that's not a good enough argument for various reasons. One is it is focused particularly on key disciplines, engineering, um, in a particular area, computing, physics as well, some in maths and, and chemistry uh, and, and a bit in psychology as well. Um, but it tends to be focused on particular areas, can be disproportionately large um, funding within those research groups and within those research, um, within those universities and in those disciplines. And so it gives it a great deal of influence and even small amounts of research funding can um, um, cause university departments to be more friendly yeah given the cash strap nature of, of, of the way budgets are more tightly controlled these days. Um, the other aspect is that by being involved at the university level, you get scientists at an early stage in their career, you develop a lifelong sympathy, interest, and this is where you recruit your next generation of scientists from. Um, and um, so that's a, a key concern around, <coughs> around the university involvement, which is much greater than is argued by the small, smaller percentage of funding. <coughs> so, to give you, um, I'll give you a few figures quickly, which looks at how military R&D spending compares with civilian R&D spending in the UK. That's another key component. Um, here's a graph. Um, right, these government figures. So, um, you see, the military is third biggest in that area. Um, health has only just overtaken it, but much larger than energy and environment and agriculture. Um, the, um, there's another one, this is a graph from uh, uh, our offensive insecurity report, so you've got the um, military R&D there. The sustainable security area is a number of areas which contribute to trying to understand and tackle the roots of conflict. So we cover a whole range of area, environmental hazards, poverty alleviation, international development, all sorts of stuff, even including all of those, it was, it was only half. Um, and to put it more starkly, this is the military budget compared with the renewable energy budget in the UK. Um, so what are we going to do about that? Campaigning, education, work. There are a number of <coughs> programs, and we can talk more about this because I'm running out of time. We can talk more about this in the break and the discussion. There's an international <coughs> campaign run by our partners, INIS, 
we'll commit universities to peace, and um, there's some being particular successes in Germany and Japan, and um, and then there's SGR programs in, in the UK, which we'll hear about particularly during the AGM later. But I just want to quickly mention Philip Woods, who's our peace worker, who's doing some research in this area. He's got a poster which you can look at at the lunch break. Um, and, um, and a range of other organisations, some of which are here today, Campaign Against Arms Trade particularly, has done um, some good work in this area. So, yeah, I will stop there. Um, and these slides will be on our website um, after the conference.